Good morning, Crosstown. If you're new or you're visiting today, I'm John. I'm the Wellsville campus pastor. Uh, glad you're with us. I want to welcome our other campuses, Arcade, Olean, uh, Shingle House, and Greece, as well as our online viewers. Uh, so glad that you're here joining us this morning. Uh, as we get ready to continue our At the Core series, and we're going to be talking about being followers and not fans. And much like the other pastors have already said, I'm going to continue to say this. These are not things that we just want to do. Uh, these are things that we want to uh, define us, who we are. We want these to be the things that when people think of us, it's just who we are. Um, before we get into that, I just want to take the opportunity uh, to introduce you uh, to my family. Uh, this is my wife, Nicole. Uh, she's been stuck with me. I mean, married to me uh, for a little over 10 years. Bless her heart. And But seriously, though, so thankful. God has really used uh, my wife and my life to, to make me more and more like Jesus, uh, which is the goal. So I'm so thankful for that. And here are the boys. We have Noah, Emmett, and Oliver. Noah, he is nine years old. He's the oldest. Uh, he really loves animals. Uh, his thing right now is, is really uh, catching things that uh, creep and crawl through the grass, things that I would just assume uh, smash with a shovel. Um, so that makes for some interesting conversations about putting things down and what things we touch and what things we don't touch. Uh, and that's Noah. And then there's Emmett. He's the middle child. He's seven. Right now, his big thing is riding bikes and scooters. He actually has a little Razor scooter that Pastor Eber gave him, and right now his thing is to fly up and down the sidewalk next to the house, racing the cars as they drive by. And, and how he does this is uh, him and Oliver is usually hit one of his spotters. They wait, and as soon as they see a car coming, one of them yells, go, and Emmett takes off up the sidewalk on his scooter to try to beat them before they pass our house. Uh, so that's Emmett. And then we have Oliver, last but not certainly least. Uh, Oliver's five. He's the youngest. Uh, he's our wild card. And by wild card, I mean he's, he's literally unpredictable. Uh, you never know what he's going to say or do, when he's going to jump on you, when he's going to try to give you a hug, all that stuff. He is a complete wild card. And that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is the shinks. Um, so hopefully... You enjoy getting to know us a little more. Uh, and now I want to start out uh, talking about followers and not fans, but I want to start out with a question for you guys, uh, and that is at all of our campuses and, and for those of you watching online, and that question is, have you ever failed to apply yourself to something? And just before you guys get all raising your hands, I just want to, I want to show you something that might help clarify the question, because I'm sure some of you are ready to raise your hand, others are confused, and some people are like, I don't even know what he's talking about. So I'm going to show you something, and hopefully it will clear things up and we'll circle back. Uh, my mom, what I want to show you is my mom is, or was, I should say, a hoarder of anything that came home from school, whether we got it in the mailbox or whether it came home in a book or a backpack. She kept everything. And right here, I'm going to show you a picture of this. This is, this is the, the file folder that everything was in that I recently received. And thankfully, my mom no longer has this in her possession. She no longer has this blackmail. But this folder, I almost put one next to it, but this folder is as thick as one of those black uh, office staplers. It's got a lot of stuff in it. It's got <clears throat> art projects, awards, um, it's got some report cards, and it's also got a fair amount of discipline reports or uh, detention slips. And that's no, that's not what I'm going to show you guys today. That's for another time. What I want to show you is a couple report cards, uh, one from grade school and one from middle school. And I, and I just want to talk to you guys uh, about this real quick. So here's my middle school report card for fifth grade. It says, John is capable of doing very well in fifth grade. He needs to be more consistent with homework assignments and work to be organized. And then second semester says, John's grades do not reflect what he is capable of. 
as we discussed on the phone, he needs to be more consistent in his work habits. So that was grade school. So the next thing I want to show you is our, my middle school report card. So go ahead, guys. Should hand in homework on time, frequently absent from class, could do better. And then I don't, it must have been a semester where there was swimming or something in gym, because I love gym class, but I hated swimming. It says, does not have proper attire for physical fitness. Excessive excuses slash absences from gym class. You see, I don't have a high school report card because it's like they just gave up on me. They just stopped putting down what the issues were and just simply gave me my grades. And the reason that my report cards say this and the reason my grades reflected it was simply put, I had the ability to retain information. And I thought I was so smart that I convinced myself I'd figured out a way to do it, the, do it the best way possible. And that was uh, to look at the syllabus when I got older and to do well on tests because, like I said, I could retain information very easily. But I would look at and figure out which homework needed to be handed in on time, which stuff I could hand in late, uh, which stuff I could avoid handing in at all, and what big projects or tests I needed to really pay attention to the teacher and what they were teaching about. So I had convinced myself that I had figured out the perfect system. But in reality, when I look back and I take an honest evaluation, really examine that time in my life, my academics for uh, grade school, elementary, and high school, the reality is simply I did not apply myself and because of that, it really impacted some aspects of my life, and some of it immediately, uh, such as getting reference letters uh, from teachers and also scholarships. So that had an immediate impact on me. So now that I have given you some, some, some context and, and showed you some of, more of my life, I want to ask you a question. And I'm going to ask that question again. It's, have you ever failed to apply yourself to something? It could have been a job. It could have been school. It could have been a friendship. And for some of you, maybe it was a marriage. And when we, apply, we fail to apply ourselves to things, it can impact our lives immediately, today, tomorrow, and sometimes it impacts for the rest of our lives. You know, maybe... Maybe you've missed out on a scholarship. Maybe you missed out on raises, promotions. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you even lost some people that really cared about you. And this brings us to the core value of we are followers and not fans. And why? Because if we fail to apply ourselves to this value, it's going to impact us immediately today tomorrow, but not just for the rest of our lives, but for eternity. And, and that's because the things that are at stake are much greater than raises, promotions, and scholarship. It's our ability to have an eternal influence on our friends, family, coworkers, and the people in our neighborhoods and communities for the gospel. So as we look at what Scripture has to say about being follower and fans, I really want us all to be asking ourselves and thinking about this question. Am I a follower or am I a fan? And whenever I think about being a follower or a fan or, or talking about this or teaching on this, it, I really always end up in the book of James. The book of James is a very practical, short book in the New Testament and it even discusses what we're going to talk about. But really, it's all about what it looks like to be a follower and not a fan. And we're going to look at three verses uh, from the book of James today that talk about this very thing. So if you have your Bible or if you have a device with you, I want to encourage you to go ahead and jump to 
James uh, chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. And if you don't have either of those things, it's okay. Uh, you can simply follow along on the side screens as we go. So James 1, 22 through 25 says this, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intensely into the, or intently, I'm sorry, into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. So three simple verses that talks about the difference between differences and talks about being a doer and a hearer, or as we're going to say, a follower or a fan. So I'm going to break down these verses and really look into the implications that this has for our lives. So verse 22 says, but be doers or followers of the word and not hearers, fans, only deceiving yourselves. See, James uses the word doer and not do. So what this implies is not a one-time thing, but a lifestyle that is marked by denying oneself to pursue the commands of God. How do we know this? Because Jesus said it himself. We have John 14, 15. Uh, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then there's another scenario we see uh, in the book of Luke in chapter 9, uh, where Jesus is uh, talking to a group of people and he's actually inviting them uh, to come and follow him. And he says this, if anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So, simply to put it, to be a doer of the word means to be actively pursuing Jesus and being a participant in the gospel. We got to be doing something. And then uh, James is talking about here, he used the words here, which is actually implying uh, somebody who knows the truth, who has heard the word, who has seen it, but simply does nothing with it. And what he's saying is that if you are a hearer or a fan, that you are deceiving yourself. And a fun fact is that word deceiving, if you were to look back into the original Greek language, is actually a mathematical term meaning miscalculation. Something doesn't add up. So if you, I, our church, or anyone says, I love Jesus and I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm not doing anything, James is saying you're actually a hearer and you've made a serious miscalculation. Because things don't add up. He goes on to explain why, though. He doesn't just leave us there. In verse 23 and 24, James says, Because if anyone is a hearer or a fan of the word and not a doer or follower, he is like a man looking at his own face in the mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And I love this example uh, because it's very practical. And much like when Jesus taught through the parables, it was something that the people could clearly understand what he's getting at. So in my hand is a mirror, thank you, from Pastor Jeremy's van. I got it before I, I came to do this message. Uh, thank you, Pastor Jeremy. Again, it was pretty easy to take out, and I think I can safely return it to your car without breaking anything. And I'll do it later. But anyway, as I digress, what can anyone tell me is the purpose of a mirror? Yes. Simply put, the purpose of a mirror is to just simply reflect what is in front of it. Nothing more and nothing less. So if I look into this mirror right now and I see that my hair is all over the place, or that I have something all over my face, and the mirror is showing me this so that I can change it, because it's revealing to me what the issue is. But James is saying, if I don't do anything, if you don't do anything with that, I'm going to walk away, and then eventually what I'm going to do is just forget 
what needs to change, period. Because the problem is that just looking into a mirror doesn't change you. It only shows you what you need to change or what the problem is. And see, and that's what James is really getting at with this example, and people have got it clearly. See, the Word of God is our mirror. It's a mirror that allows us to look into and remind us of who we are in Christ. Loved, chosen, created. It allows us to see ourselves the way that God sees us and not how the world sees us. But, Just reading the word or hearing a sermon or learning about stuff doesn't change us. We got to do something. So when we look at ourselves in the mirror of Scripture and we don't do anything, what we're doing is we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus. We're not allowing him to show us his love for us. Instead, we walk away forgetting about anything that we have to change or, or what is being revealed to us, and we proceed as normal. And when we do this, we end up walking away, wondering why we're never content, we wonder why we struggle with our faith, and we wonder why we never feel like we're enough. You see, because without transformation, without doing something, It's just information. That's what James is getting at. If I just look into this mirror and see my reflection, but I don't take any action, what good is it? Again, because looking into a mirror doesn't change us. It only shows us the changes that we need to make. And then... Verse 25, James goes on to say, but the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer or a fan, but one who does good works, a follower, this person will be blessed in what he does. See, when we are doers of the word, what we're telling the world is that we are valued and that we are loved by Jesus, and that we find our worth in loving and serving him. We have a lifestyle marked by denying ourselves and picking up our cross daily. And when we are doers and not just hearers, we will understand that information should lead to transformation. And that transformation leads to a life of doing good deeds that God has already prepared for us, and that by doing these good deeds, he's just going to make us more and more like our Lord Jesus. What James is also saying is that we are not saved by our good deeds, but it does have a direct impact on the fruit of our lives. And I want to share with you a story that, to me, really puts this all in perspective. I had a great privilege to be a part of a funeral recently for for a lady who attended the Wellsville campus for a long time. Uh, She was on um, home care, uh, homebound for a long time, longer than, in fact, I had even been here. Her name was Margaret Benedict. Uh, So some of you uh, from Wellsville know her well. Some of you know her name. Uh, But that's all I really knew about Margaret, too, was her name. I knew her name, and I knew that uh, she was part of the core group of people or cornerstone group of people that really built the Wellsville Alliance Church that we're in right now uh, before it was Crosstown, long before we were Crosstown and Pastor Jeremy was here. And that's all I knew about her. I didn't know about uh, where she served or how well she loved people. I didn't really know much about her relationship with Jesus. But that all changed on June 26th of this year at her grade five funeral service. And I want to tell you that uh, Margaret's funeral will be one that I will remember uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, I, I welcomed everyone that was showing up. I welcomed them to the service. 
And then I turned the mic over uh, to friends and family who wanted to share about Margaret and her life. And what was shared during that time was one of the most beautiful testimonies that I have ever been privileged to hear. Because as people shared about Margaret's life, the gospel was clearly revealed. I got to hear about how Margaret loved Jesus and how she really pursued him with her whole life. She shared the gospel with everyone that she met, and her and her family were instrumental in the building of the Wellsville Church, both physically and as far as the building, but also spiritually in the discipleship of many people that attended church here. Margaret also shared her faith and shared Jesus with many people in our community. I got to hear about her love for and support of missions, both in the U.S. and all around the world, and also how no matter what happened with her or her family, her faith was steadfast because she knew that God was in control. Her family talked about how she was always praying for them and encouraging them through Scripture uh, because her faith was so real and her love of Jesus was so contagious that God used her to lead some of them to a relationship with Jesus. It was in those moments that I really began to realize and and, and wrestle with the idea that no sermon or message that I was going to share uh, was going to be a better presentation of the gospel to people than Margaret's own testimony of not just knowing who Jesus was, but living for him. It really made such an impact on me, and you can ask Nicole that. As soon as I left the cemetery, I actually called Nicole and told her about how much of an impact uh, that Margaret had had and how much of a legacy that she had left behind by simply following Jesus. And even though Margaret was already celebrating eternity with Jesus and is, Her life did and still has an eternal impact for those who hear about her testimony, hear about her life, and how Margaret was really a follower of Jesus and not just a fan. So I want you to track with me, church. I want you to to just stop and think about this real quick. And I want us to, to, to ask ourselves or imagine what could be, what if everyone who called Crosstown their home, we're just going to start out with Crosstown, if everyone who calls Crosstown their home church, what if we were all as committed to following Jesus as Margaret was? What if we had a life that was marked by denying ourselves and picking up our cross daily? Can you imagine really the peace and comfort of knowing who we are in Jesus and knowing that he's in control, the blessings that we would receive for doing his good works, and our ability to be able to have eternal influence on our friends, family, coworkers, and the peoples in our neighborhoods and in our communities. We have to remember, the goal is not to be a hearer of the word, but to be a doer. We need to be a follower and not just a fan. So how do we do that, Pastor John? I'm glad you asked. It's a great question. I want to I want to answer that for you with two things. And these aren't a to-do list for this week. These are things that If you're going to go ahead and do, it needs to become who we are and not just something that we've done, all right? And the first one is we need to always take an honest evaluation. In order to be followers and not fans, the first thing we do is make an honest evaluation of how we as individuals and how we as a church as a whole are doing when it comes to being a follower of Jesus. And the only way that we can do that is if we really take a look into the mirror of Scripture and we see ourselves the way that God sees us. When we see the changes that we need to make 
in the mirror. Because I don't know about you guys, but in 10 to 15 years, I don't, I don't want to be sitting around and I don't want to be looking back wondering what could have been if I had had those conversations, what could have been if I had been more intentional about loving people in the name of Jesus, what could have been if I had been more bold in my faith, and what could have been? What more could God have done with my life if I had simply been more of a follower and less of a fan? The second thing is, it's, it's, it's easy, it's the one thing principle. It's not a to-do, this is something that we just make a part of who we are, and that is we need to get to a place where we take one thing from every sermon, every word, every time we read our Bibles, every time we read about Jesus and his life, we need to take one thing from that mirror and apply it to changing our lives to become more like Jesus. Remember, church, this is crucial because if we fail to apply ourselves to this very thing, it's going to impact today, tomorrow, and it's going to impact eternity. And the reason is because the things that are at stake are not simply scholarships, they're not simply raises or promotions. It's our testimony, our relationship with Jesus in our ability to have an eternal influence with our friends, families, coworkers, and the people in our neighborhoods and communities for the gospel. We all need to ask ourselves this question. Am I a follower or am I a fan? We pray with me this morning. God, I am so incredibly thankful that you have shown your grace and mercy in our lives time and time again. Lord, I thank you for the reminder that your word is the mirror into our lives of what we really look like and who we really are. I thank you that we are redeemed, that we are chosen, and that we are loved, and that we are family. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage and the boldness to take a look in that mirror, Lord, and not just to see the imperfections in our reflections, Lord, but to do something about them, knowing that so much more is at stake than our comfort, Lord. Help us to desire to have eternal impact on those around us. Help us to cherish your word. Help us desire you. Help us to pursue you. And help us to be known for being people that deny ourselves and pick up our cross daily. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen.